Hi there from Microsoft Silicon Valley Campus Amphitheater. Today I'm going to talk about our experience from scaling up large language models serving. Actively, I started working with LLM since 2015, and so my timeline starts there. LSTMs and seek to seek were the state of the art back then. In Gmail Intelligence, we launched Smart Reply, which used LSTMs initially. The Transformer paper was published in 2017. It was a game changer for LLMs. In Google Translate, we did see massive quality gains, but the latency and the compute cost limited us to launching only a couple of language pairs initially. We did deliver impressive quality gains by playing around with the training data, though. In 2020, GPT-3 launched, and by 21, the vision models also joined the transformer train. Multimodal and generative models are the state of the art now. Model sizes have also seen exponential growth during this time. From 200 or 300 million parameters in GNMT, Google's Neural Machine Translation Model, to 175 billion in GPT-3. Over 1,000x increase. By now, all from apps to devices like phones, cars, AI has become ubiquitous in our daily lives. GPT-3 particularly was the inflection point for LLMs. Both the size of the model and the number of models took off since the launch of GPT-3, passing over trillion parameters at this time. These models excel at many things, including writing stories, music. For me, it's my travel time language buddy, especially in deciphering the village names in Switzerland. LLMs are proving to be a truly disruptive tech. Models like ChatGPTs have been changing our habits. Day-to-day -day things like search is becoming a conversational activity as opposed to query, result, repeat paradigm. With larger model sizes, larger prompt sizes, and increased demand, building systems that scale is a problem we are all trying to solve. In my talk today, I'll share some of the optimizations we found useful in Microsoft's Azure Machine Learning Platform. First, though, we'll go through a few basics. Starting with the transformer model, the GPT variation of it, grounding us in numbers will help us understand the optimizations work. The transformer model is a sequence of blocks. The three primary blocks are encodings, in pink color, attention, the orange ones, and feed forward, sprinkled in with layer normalization, softmax, etc. With the feed forward layers versus recurrent in RNN, transformers could process entire sequence in parallel, making it much faster to train. The attention block helps the network focus on the right few words, and the multi head split captures even richer representations. In the example, Meta is a great company. The model brings attention to Meta when processing the word company. In other words, the score for the query company and keyword Meta is higher as compared to company and A or company and is. The last table shows the attention across all layers and heads all cells mostly agree on the company in meta scores, except one cell in each row, which shows the word being most important to itself, like is is to is and a is to a. The transformer model from the paper has an encoder and a decoder component. Both encoder and decoder play a role during inference for models such as translation, GPT-3, on the other hand, is a decoder-only model with a few modifications. It has embeddings, self-attention, and feed-forward blocks. It doesn't need the cross-attention from the encoder. Next, wanted to ground us in numbers a bit. The table on the right is from OpenAI. It has different flavors of GPT-3 models they trained. 
the outer blue box is referred to as a layer. It includes almost all boxes except embeddings and task-specific heads. Most models here have the same number of layers and heads. They are as tall as wide. The complexity and cost of inference is typically related to the number of parameters in the model, which makes the last row with 175 billion an interesting one. Projecting back on the diagram, GPT-3-175B has 96 layers, so 96 of the blue boxes. Within each layer, the attention block has 96 heads of size 128 units, which equals to about 12,288 parameters in each attention block. All models use a context window of 2,048 tokens, and the vocabulary size is 50,257. All of these numbers are far smaller, and it's not clear where 175 billion comes from. The math comes from Robert Eubin's work. Total number of parameters is equal to the sum of parameters from each of the blocks. So parameters from word embeddings, positional embedding, attention, and feed forward blocks. 115 billion, close to two thirds of the parameters, come from the feed forward layer. Most of the rest of the one-third come from the attention block. Most flops, then, would be spent in the feed-forward blocks, and so any optimization in this block would have a high return on investment. Given the n-square nature of attention, operations in the attention block, memory-related work, caching, would make a difference here. Now that we know where the calories are spent, let's go to the platform. A typical ML platform has two pillars, training and serving, supported by data stores such as feature store, asset registry, embedding store, and workflow engines like fine tuning and prompt flow, and APIs that cover a range of latency and cost options like online patch, dedicated pay-as-you-go. For the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on inference. Within inference, the four areas we are going to zoom into, starting from the lowest layer, kernel, model, scheduler, and finally, go through one of the key insights from our work in metrics. In each layer, I'll focus on optimizations that are available widely that you could leverage in your work. First is MSQL from Microsoft, built on top of NVIDIA's Nickel. NCCL, pronounced Nickel, offers a topology-aware GPU communication primitives. It has message-passing algorithms such as Ring or Tree. The GPU host here has eight GPUs laid out in what looks like two fully connected subsets. Each GPU then has three to four GPUs within one hop, but the rest can be as far as three hops. Consider an operation like all gather that gathers the data from each rank and provides it to all ranks, and then repeat it for a large number of messages in an inference scenario. The communication overhead is noticeable. MSQL provides additional algorithm that ensures a two hop option. The latency wins are seen for small messages such as in inference. There are other topologies like NDV4 that also deliver two hops communication and more coming up from AMD, etc. Keep an eye on this space. After interconnect, it's time to optimize compute. CUDA graphs from NVIDIA allows to launch a graph. Inference at high level is a collection of kernels grouped into operators, connected by dependencies, it's a graph. The kernels are launched by the CPU and executed on the GPU, launching separately, as in the diagram above the brown line. Especially when the kernel execution time is small, of a few microseconds, results in a spaced pattern. Graph launch below the brown line 
submit submits all work at once reducing the total launch overhead and defragging gpu time it's a different paradigm and quite useful after compute and interconnect it's time to look for memory bottlenecks attention even though it has fewer total parameters it has larger memory overhead and caching keys and values is helpful nvidia's implementation of transformer typically takes care of the caching caching will play a key role during the batch scheduling and matrix discussion later at model level one of the widely used technique is model partitioning or model parallelism the diagram here is same as the one we saw earlier just laid out horizontally and each block expanded with operators pipeline parallelism distributes layer in a model across the hosts and tensor parallelism then slices each of the layers and distributes the chunks across multiple gpus adding in synchronization points the four dark green bars in particular depending on your gpu memory available and target utilization you are driving for you would need different number of host to serve one request denoted by depth d here half the memory would then result in double the depth or double the number of hosts if what you have is k it is you have a lot of work ahead of you the layers are divided across the hosts evenly and tensors across gpus the cross host communication happens via mpi next in the li list of model optimizations is lora a fine tuning methodology developed by microsoft fine tuning typically modifies some weights in the model to generate another full size model inference then has to pay full cost for each request doubling the storage cost and the serving capacity costs one of the ones for the base model and then again for the fine tuned model lora leaves the pre trained model weights untouched adding in two small matrices a and b of dimension d by r where r is configurable as small as 1 You can envision the storage savings, compute savings, scheduling flexibility, caching possibilities, and reuse possibilities coming out of it. Typically, you influence the layers and weights in the attention and feed forward blocks by experimenting and testing with some easy, medium, hard test sets. Particularly, hard test sets are the key. for there are other options that you could leverage for easier ones as well lora find the fine tuning for your model is well worth the time github lora repo has a number of lora recipes for popular models as well as samples you could leverage there's a lot going on in this area keep an eye out as we move up the stack into the platform layers batching offers the first optimization opportunity the graph here plots processing time by batch size batch processing time does not increase linearly with the batch size the curve from the graph looks more logarithmic and the larger the batch size higher the throughput the processing times are better for batch sizes of the powers of 2 so a batch size of 16 would be faster than 15 or 17 but bucketing the request into small medium large helps small request not be blocked behind a large one you can then schedule batches using round robin or some scheme some such strategy but routing the request considering the kv cache rate further reduces the processing time this is a typical serving setup with heterogeneous compute load balancer and regional endpoints i'll call out a couple of design choices latency sensitive online and non sensitive batch requests are often served via separate queues increasing the cogs cost but keeping cloud 
3P in mind, we opted for label-based configurable routing. Online and batch are priority labels. Across the region, you could configure to send, let's say, 60% traffic to one region and 40 to another. The configurability also provides needed reliability in case of outages. As the number of GPU allo allocated scales, it becomes increasingly important to drive correct utilization. The first step here is to establish the right metric. The out-of-the-box metric is GPU utilization and GPU power draw. While driving for the utilization for Bing, we realize that it does not show the right picture. GPU utilization, the graph shown on the left, hits 80% even under light load. Key insight is that larger batch size results in higher throughput and therefore better utilization, and batch size is limited by GPU memory. By measuring KV utilization, we were able to call out the true headroom and drive higher utilization. So what is KV utilization? It is simply the number of tokens generated divided by the total a particular SKU can do. The higher the number, better and truer the utilization. We can optimize what we measure, and so spend time finding the right metric for your model and for your use case. Find the bottlenecks if it's memory, compute, interconnect. Measure it and have fun driving it down. The right metric or metrics is an ongoing area of work for us as well. In closing, I asked a couple of chatbots to write me a poem with keywords from my talk, AI, ML, transformer, attention, and platform optimizations. I like the lines, AI, ML, transformer, the trio that's taking over, and character character.ai is more realistic message of, all things come at a cost. How would we define if it's truly worth it? Impressive lines. Definitely couldn't have come up with them by myself. But it was not easy. It took many tries, dealing with many meaningless responses. And so I look forward, first, to better operationalization support. I hope we have widely adopted task success metrics along with language fluency and accuracy metrics. And most important, we work on improving trust and predictability of the results. As the models become reliable, they would then become more useful also to the non-domain area expert. If I wasn't familiar with English language nuances, not sure if I wouldn't have embarrassed myself in the previous poem. Yashua Benjio in his 2019 Neurip Stocks spoke about System 1 and System 2. System 1 gives habitual responses, while System 2 tries to reason about the answer as it's generating it. It would be great to see those proposals mainstream. Now that the limbic system is advanced enough, let's work on the neocortex for LLMs. Have the model reflect retrospect. The human creativity mostly doesn't go off the rail because of rules, norms, and ethics. Let's build some guardrails into the models. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me, to Meta for inviting me, and to my colleagues who answered my many, many, many questions. Thank you.